While the NBA Finals started out as a rematch of last year's teams, it quickly turned into a redo for the Warriors as they took a commanding 3-1 lead with the closeout game at home. But something curious happened in Game 4, and in Game 5, the Cavs unlocked something in their offense that continued to help them in Game 6 as well. When studying LeBron's offensive game in the Finals, the way he attacks breaks out into three distinct categories, post-up, isolation, and pick and roll. When you track the distribution of these actions across the six games, you can see how the Cavs have made subtle shifts to get better balance from LeBron, culminating in two of the best offensive performances we've ever seen in games five and six. Let's start by examining the post-up, which is essentially an isolation with his back to the basket. In Game 1, the Cavs stuck to the game plan they used in last year's Finals, with a whopping 13 backdowns on the block. As a natural facilitator, LeBron isn't as comfortable shooting these shots as much as drawing the attention of the defense and kicking out. LeBron took shots on only 6 of the 13 post-ups in Game 1, and while those possessions yielded a .92 points per possession, the offense was stagnant and made it easier for the defense to shut down his teammates. After the Game 1 loss, the Cavs radically altered how they used LeBron in the post, only getting him there five times, lessening the blow of a woefully inefficient output. And most of the post-ups were in the second quarter, when the Warriors went on a 20-2 run to take control of the game. Games 3 and 4, he got even less post-ups, but was able to have the most success out of that action, indicating that minimizing this action is actually better for the overall production of the team. Yet, up until this point, the team was on the verge of being eliminated down 3-1. Let's switch to isolation and examine how the Cavs used LeBron in hero mode. The first three games were remarkably consistent for him, as he isolated about the same amount each time and was very efficient. As far as scoring goes, LeBron used this attack to get his own points far more often than setting up teammates. And he was an equal opportunity scorer, distributing his points pretty equally on primary LeBron defenders Sean Livingston, Klay Thompson, and Andre Iguodala. Of his teammates, Tristan Thompson got the most field goal attempts from LeBron ISOs and has scored on every single one of them through the first six games. Attacking from the perimeter in an isolation is similar to the post-up in the sense that the defense can load up to help with so much stagnation from his teammates. And the nadir of this series was Game 4, when he isolated a ridiculous 15 times for a terrible .53 points per possession, and it played a big role in the Cavaliers' loss as he isolated seven times in the fourth quarter alone, with five consecutive empty trips when the Cavaliers lost their lead and allowed the Warriors to win going away. Now let's look at his pick and rolls, since this is the only action of the three that gets multiple players moving on and off ball at the same time. The first four games were pretty consistent in terms of how often they ball screen for LeBron, and after their initial struggles in games one and two, they started to figure out how to score more often. Certainly setting a screen with Curry's man at the elbow doesn't give much time for the defense to react, and he gets the easy score. And against the small ball lineup of death, by screening with Draymond's man and spacing with shooters, it becomes very difficult to stop the good ball movement along the perimeter until JR can rise up for the wide open look. And Game 3 showed an awakening for LeBron's outside shot as he was able to knock down some long twos, shots the Warriors are happy to give up, but points the Cavs will gladly take. And even though they lost Game 4 down the stretch, in the fourth quarter of that game, they ran it four times and got four baskets for LeBron. A quick drag screen caught everybody unprepared and out of position, allowing LeBron free throws. Then they ran a clever set to screen for Kyrie before he screened for LeBron. This catches Harrison Barnes out of position, and Draymond is a little worried about leaving Jefferson open for a corner three and isn't there to help. Someone on the Cavs must have seen something here since there was an explosion of LeBron pick and rolls in Game 5. They got LeBron attacking in 17 of them, 
and while the efficiency wasn't quite as good as games 3 and 4, they found a loophole with Draymond Green being suspended. In Game 3, notice how Draymond can get screened off, but then swoop in and block this layup. And when he was guarding LeBron, he can disrupt his natural passing game with his long arms and make it hard to hit the roll man. And I think Draymond acts as a natural deterrent, as it seems LeBron might be hesitant to attack the rim if he's down there, and it allows Green to be in good position to get precious defensive rebounds for the Warriors. Now let's look at Game 5 without Draymond. With this group, we typically see Green at center instead of Verajao, who gets blown by. Or we would have seen Green on Jefferson, two steps away from a contest and possible block like we had seen earlier. And you can imagine, had Draymond been in and matched up with Tristan Thompson, he would have certainly contested this easy layup off the pick and roll for LeBron. So after studying all of this film, what are the conclusions? First off, LeBron is still the most dangerous player in the NBA, and it's a testament to his abilities that he can be so stagnant in so many possessions and yet still detonate back-to-back 40-point -back games while spending a lot of time standing around so often. This isn't a knock on him as much as a comment on the offense he plays in, mind you. And it's also clear that Draymond Green is vital to the Warriors' hopes in slowing him down even a little bit. Just watch how disruptive he can be when he's in the area of a LeBron post-up, causing the offense to bog down and force LeBron into a jumper as the shot clock winds down. And here's another example of blowing up a post-up with a quick dig down to distract LeBron till Iguodala can strip him and force the turnover. And just being in position to shadow LeBron to limit a quick attack into the lane makes his teammates that much better defensively. As I see it, the key is to have Draymond guarding Tristan Thompson and Barnes on Kevin Love with Iguodala on LeBron. This allows maximum disruption of the post-ups, isolations, and pick and rolls. Green has been great at leaving Thompson to contest, then getting right back into play to dig out rebounds. Here's another example of Draymond guarding Thompson, which allows him to roam the paint enough to act as a deterrent to a LeBron drive. And if you still haven't fully comprehended how important Draymond is on defense, just watch how he expertly leaves Thompson to blow up a possible pass to LeBron, forcing a complete reset of the offense as the clock ticks down below 10 seconds. And then he again helps off Thompson on the LeBron isolation drive, knocking it loose until JR has to toss up a rush shot. Of course, this ends up in a Kevin Love corner three, but that's a lot of work to get a rare shot for Love. And one last example of Draymond guarding Tristan Thompson. Watch how he can ignore Thompson to completely take away the lob pass to LeBron, then get back in position to defend the pick and roll for Kyrie, and then rotate over to save the possession as LeBron got right to the hoop but gets blocked at the rim. Wow. For the Cavaliers, let's look at some examples of the matchups they need to exploit in order to win Game 7. The secret sauce is when Draymond is guarding Kevin Love, who doesn't get nearly enough credit for opening things up with his gravity. If they put him in the corner and run a pick and roll to that side, it puts Draymond in an impossible situation. He simply can't leave Love one pass away in the corner, opening up all sorts of things for the offense. Same idea here as he tries to dig down on LeBron and get right back to Love, but it leaves openings for the offense to get right to the basket. Even though these shots miss, I'm sure the Cavaliers would be just fine getting these in Game 7. And here's another example where, for some reason, Draymond switched off of Thompson so he could get Love. But same result, he can't help off of him onto LeBron, who gets a nice sweeping finger roll as Barnes is powerless to stop it. So there you have it, sports fans. Lots to digest before tomorrow's Game 7. And I'm sure the coaches have been studying the film nonstop all weekend. It'll be interesting to see if LeBron can maintain a proper balance between his post-ups, isolations, and pick and rolls. And if they can get the right defensive matchups and make the right play calls out of those, then Cleveland will be celebrating their first pro sports title in 52 years.